Hello, everybody, and welcome to the uh, first episode of what we hope will be many of what we are calling the Merriam-Webster book thing. Um, my name is Amon Shea. I'm an editor at Merriam-Webster, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Emily Brewster, senior editor at Merriam-Webster, and novelist Miranda Popke, who is the author of this lovely book, Topics of Conversation. Um, and we've started this book club as a way of uh, recommending books that we find interesting in terms of language use or in any particular way. Um, and we, our, our hope and our plan for it is that it will differ somewhat from other book clubs in that we are trying to free ourselves from what I call the tyranny of plot and things that people typically discuss in book groups and focus primarily on the language. and. Um, and we're very pleased that you've all joined us and that many of you have chosen to read this, this, this book. Um, and what we would like to do is Emily and I will be uh, talking with Miranda about her book specifically insofar as her, some of her, her, her language choices and, and, and how she views dictionaries and, and, and words. Um, and Emily and I will be asking questions and having a conversation and it's intended to be a very colloquial uh, sort of discussion. Uh, as befits a book which is about conversations between women. Um, and if anybody would like to ask questions, please feel free to type them into the chat. And as we go along, we will try to uh, bring these questions into the conversation. Um, so anyway, hello, Miranda. Thank you for coming and joining us. Um, hello. Uh, hello to you both um, and hello to everyone who is um, watching and listening. I'm very grateful uh, to have everyone here and very grateful to be here. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited to, to, I'm excited to do away with the strictures of plot. <laughs> okay, great. No plot here. Uh, well, I, I wanted to jump right in and, and, and talk about some of the things that, that, that really caught my eye. And in particular, I think my, my favorite sentence in the whole book and, and I'd like to reemphasize that I really loved this book. I just felt like it was it was such a confident and original voice, um, and it, it it required commitment on the part of the reader, and it felt like it was just so rewarding. But my my favorite sentence, I think, was, and, and I'm going to try to kind of vocalize the, your 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 commas because the commas are a big part of it. And it comes on page 96, and it was I would eventually, I was aware of this. I was not so holy without feeling that I did not care about this, have to, I think the term is deal with. And that, that's such a, a, that sentence is like a beautiful syntactic nightmare. Um, I mean, it's, it's this great train wreck of, of mixing things up. But what I love about it is that it, it follows almost none of the traditional rules that we think about governing sentence structure, but it's so obvious that it's, it's intentional very intentional, it was well thought out, you worked on it and it's very logical. And to me, it's just this, this lovely representation of the way that somebody might speak either to themselves or to another person. And again, it, it bespeaks to me a confidence that I find really intoxicating as a reader. And it's a complex sentence, it requires a certain commitment on the part of the reader, but ultimately is also really rewarding, which is to me kind of the, the book as a whole. And so, what I wanted to do is ask, can you tell us a bit about your approach to recreating conversational speech, which this book is so much based on and, and how that differs from writing what we think of as traditional prose? Yeah, that's a, that's a, great, that's a great question. Um, and thank you for highlighting uh, one of the sentences that I, I think we were just talking about this before we went live, but I think one of the sentences that probably drove a few of my, um, a few of my critics on Goodreads a little bit um, a little bit wild with frustration. I So it's very important to me that, it was very important to me when I was writing this, that the sentences that were meant to be spoken either um, to, to someone or, or that the, the narrator sort of speaking to herself, that they in some way retain the hesitance and the the circling back and all of the the verbal tics that I think tend not to show up in um tend not to show up in in books and in in films as well I 
you know, I'm a great fan of Rachel Cusk and she is obviously her, her outline trilogy is a great influence on, on this book. Um, one thing that she does do that I really admire, but that I went in a different direction is all of her characters speak in very, um, they speak in, in very classically beautiful sentences. Um, to the extent that you, you sort of can't imagine that someone would actually be speaking so cogently, so logically, so lyrically at such length. Um, and I don't think that that detracts. I think that we're just, we're trying to do slightly different things. Um, but these sentences, I, so I had a, I had a teacher uh, in, when I, when I was doing my MFA, Catherine Davis, who told me that the best way to revise, and I, I've repeated this a number of times because I find it, I, I found it so sort of such a breakthrough for me personally, was to um, retype. So I did spend a lot of time actually um, sort of printing out sections of the book, marking them up, and then actually retyping them. And in retyping them and hearing them again and again in my head, and then sometimes even saying them out loud, um, I, I found, I was able to find a rhythm that was not exactly like spoken language because that's actually not, you don't actually want to read spoken language in a book because it, it's too dense with these kinds of filler words and, um, and, and sentences don't quite end in the way that you want them to, but it, it, I was able to sort of, I think, retain some of the feeling. Um, I was listening to a lot of podcasts at the time, so I think I also had people's voices in my head more often than not. I don't like being alone with my thoughts. So I'm, I'm constantly trying to listen to something that is overriding whatever neurotic business is going on up here. Um, and I do also think, so I, I, I'm not like a working translator, but I do read some uh, and, and have done a little bit of translation from the Italian. And the way that commas are used, the way that sentences are structured um, in Italian is quite different. Um, they're just, there's a lot more freedom to extend the sentence via a comma um, in a way that would not be grammatically correct in English. Um, and so I think that that gave me an interesting perspective as well from which to approach the problem. I noticed also your punctuation in, uh, in conversation and dialogue varied quite a bit. In the, first, in the first story, there is no, none of the typical dialogue punctuation um, but then in later stories, there is, and some stories had it and some stories didn't, and some stories started without it and then got it. And um, I, was, I, was, um, I was so interested in how easy it was for me to follow it. I, I noticed it because I was reading it for this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I don't know, um, I probably would have noticed it otherwise, but it was really surprising to me how it, it, it felt smoother. It felt, um, I, I, felt like I, was, I felt like I was deeper into the conversation than I might have been. Um, and now I, I'm interested in seeing more dialogue without, without quotation marks. I, yeah, I found the, the lack of quotation marks really useful when I wanted to minimize the extent to which the reader was thinking about dialogue as being somehow marked off mm. from the, the rest of the prose that was in the book. Um, another great influence on this novel was uh, Rings of Saturn um, by uh, Zabalt, which I'd read quite recently or quite, you know, just sort of a few months before I, I started writing this. And he does in that book something that I was like totally, it was like mind exploding. He hands off the narration from one person to another person in the middle of a sentence. Um, I can sort of picture it actually. I, it was, it was so, it created such an impression that I can sort of picture where it happens on the page. Uh, and I, I was reading and reading and, and then I suddenly realized, oh, I don't actually know who's speaking. And so I had to go back a few pages to find, and it was, it was right in the middle of a sentence. Um, there's like a comma and a handoff to a different character and suddenly they're speaking. Um, and that's the kind of thing that you can't do sort of as sneakily if you're marking dialogue off with quotation marks. Yeah. Um, and, and sometimes I thought it was very important to note maybe there were more than, there was more than one person speaking and I wanted to, it was important to note who was speaking when. And at other times it was more important for the thread of the voice to carry from one character to another or from sort of the narrative voice into a character who might be speaking. Mm -hmm. um, so, 
Yeah, I think it, it really depended on, it depended on whether I wanted the reader to be sort of carried through or I was asking them to stop and pause as, as things were going back, as dialogue was, was moving back and forth. You know, something that you, you just said earlier that I, I really rang true to me was um, when you said that you don't really want to read actual dialogue. And that's, I think often we think we do, we think we want accuracy. And then when you, if you ever want to really kind of humble yourself in terms of how you speak, or I found this myself, is have somebody surreptitiously record you in natural speech and then transcribe it. It is just brutal. I just sound like an absolute fool. Um, and I, I think most people feel that way. It's, it's full of hesitancies and meanderings and not in a planned way. It's just, and you know, people follow along. But, um, but I, I think it's what's particularly uh, intriguing to me here is that you are creating the feel of conversation with, you know, the, the, without actually replicating it accurately, which I, I would imagine is, is tremendously difficult to do. Um, but one thing I also just wanted to touch on is um, what's also, it, I know you're not changing the narration from one person to another, as you just said, but I, I do find it, it what, what really required effort on my part was to follow along with the, you're changing the, the method of recounting these conversations. And another one of my favorite parts was on, on, on page 96, where you have starting over is difficult and painful and the past isn't dead and buried and isn't even etc which to me is it's so great because it feels I, I, maybe i'm misinterpreting it but it felt like you're you're, you're referencing this this well-known faulkner quote and you're paraphrasing it but it seems to me the narrator is talking to herself so she doesn't need to finish the sentence because when we talk to ourselves we we just you can just start the sentence you know where it's going to go um, and so it, it just kind of gives you this, this, this lovely evanescent kind of outline of, of conversation without hammering. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's precisely it. Um, I, think, I think you sort of can't use that quotation seriously anymore because it has lost, it has lost whatever. Um, I mean, I think it, it, it's, a, it's a potent observation. You know, it appears in truncated form in the novel because I, I respond to it as a reader. And I, I think that the point that it's making is one that is worth contemplating, but that, that sentiment in those words is no longer a revelation. And I just needed to communicate my narrator knows that quotation. She, and that's what she means. She means, she means that package of thought and to reproduce it in full would be to a certain extent I mean, waste, it would be wasting her own time. Um, so, so she doesn't. Um, and I also think like, if you don't catch that illusion, I also, I think it's fine. I think, I think you've gotten enough in the first half that you can sort of tell where the rest of that thought is going. Sure. I agree. And I, I think it's really, uh, it, it's important overall, the, the narrator's, um, the, her background as a reader and as a scholar and as a writer, she is so clearly deeply connected to language and to literature and this is her realm. And so as she's recounting all these stories, she, she's, she's, very, she's very clearly in her element. I mean, she is, words are her, her, her mode of, of, of not just expressing, but it seems to be like a mode of being. Yeah, I had to make her an English grad student or I couldn't have gotten away with writing her <laughs> in the way that I wanted to. Um, <laughs> I believe that, yeah. <laughs> That's <laughs> It's true for me as well that as someone who spends a lot of time with language, it's also a, a way that I put a barrier up between myself and the world. And I think that she does this to such an extent that it's it's really, it's really ultimately hurting her. Um, but all of the sort of the diversions and the thoughts that are truncated and the digressions on a particular word, these are all ways for her, even if she's talking to herself, to not get to the point because the point is painful. And I think that that's something that, that's something that certainly I do. And, and I found it, um, I, I found it, you know, sort of natural to, to, to put on the page in that way, because it feels like a way that you can defend yourself from yourself while still pretending that you're having the conversation that you're that you need to be having about whatever it is that's going on. Right. 
Yeah, I think she also, um, she, she also is clearly attached to specificity and to accuracy in some cases, right? Like the, I actually made, a, made some notes about things that she had glossed. So she says that she is not a smoker because she only smokes other people's cigarettes, right? Like, so to be a smoker, you have to buy your own cigarettes. Um, she defines uh, luxury as sustained pleasure, right? Like she goes to the trouble of, of being very specific about what she means. And she, she does this in a bunch of different ways, you know, by prevent, I mean, avoid the necessity of. There are a number of cases where she, she, is, she is choosing her words very carefully and then making sure that the reader understands exactly what she means. Yes, um, I think that that kind of, that kind of precision is, important to her because she is concerned with being understood mm -hmm. and I think she's concerned with understanding herself and she's concerned with communicating um communicating with the reader and it's also you know honestly something that I find myself sometimes frustrated with when I don't know exactly the way in which you know when I read a sentence and I don't know exactly the way in which the words are being used and I feel I feel unsure about whether I'm really grasping the meaning. And I think that that's why it takes me a really long time to write even the simplest email because I wanna make sure that I'm <laughs> communicating um, precisely the thought that like the thought that I have in my head is like getting into the, into the brain of the person who is going to receive the email, which is of course not how language works. It's just not possible. Um, but I think, you know, she's, she's inscrutable to others. I think she, she means to be inscrutable to the reader. She's a certain, she's to a certain extent inscrutable to herself, but when she is going to communicate something, she wants to be quite certain that she has done her very best to communicate that thing right. to the reader. Um, and I think, yeah, I think also they're just there. It's easy to take for granted that when I say the word, um, you know, provoke that you know what I mean, that we're yeah. using that, that your understanding of the word is, is, you know, fully congruent with my understanding of the word in this particular context. But I think in a lot of cases, it's just not true. Um, and sometimes I hear, sometimes I hear myself saying something and I realize, oh no, that's not quite what I meant, what I meant. Or like, an, I, I will, I will like have like two friends will be having an argument and it's not that they disagree. It's that one person expressed something in a way that the, the second person didn't understand. Mm -hmm. um, and I find that, you know, it's, I mean, the ambiguities of language is it's one of the most, the beautiful fruitful spaces to be, but it's also, yeah. it can be a real problem. <laughs> yes, yeah, I, I have, photographers I have, the, I, have, have some familiarity with this. <laughs> yeah. I think Emily is, is uh, she, well, she's she's a, a long-term editor at Miriam Webster, but her specialty is is defining like, the mammoth words by which I mean the, the little tiny words that are incredibly semantically rich. I mean Emily is in charge of defining words like set and put, which are just unbelievably complex and just monstrous things. You know, this, to me, it's evidence of no real god in the universe because how can you put <laughs> the kind of complexity on people who have to try to define it? Um, I personally have the opposite problem of you with words. I, I take a very Humpty Dumpty approach to language and just assume that the word means whatever I want it to mean, no matter what it says, and hope that people are going to figure it out via, via the context, which doesn't, I, I don't recommend that for anybody. Uh, that, that brings us, I think, to one of the questions that Mary Elizabeth wrote a few minutes ago. And she, she said, at times I feel, felt like the unnamed narrator was, uh, was a bit of an unreliable narrator in part because of the way in which even other characters' dialogue is filtered through her voice. She wants to know if that was deliberate. And I, I felt that too, judging from the line, which I also loved, I would not call us my friend and I liars, nor would I call us in general honest, which speaks to both unreliability and semantic ambiguity at the same time, I think. So can you tell us something of that? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, that's, it was definitely, I mean, what I wanna say is like, yes, it was definitely deliberate, but it was, it was, it was also, um, it was also clear to me the book was not going to work in the way that I wanted it to work if I were bringing in voices that were quite, quite disparate from my narrator. So I, I did try to modulate to a certain extent, you know, the, um, there's uh, the, the chapter in which the, the narrator watches a, a video. Of a yeah. Yeah. Right. The Norman Mailer chapter. Was, 
Um, I did try to, I, I tried to have that woman speak in a, in a language that was inflected with the language of the 50s and 60s. Um, you know, at one point she, she uses the word dungarees for jeans, which I would never have believed people actually said. It sounds like the kind of, you know, the kind of um, spice that a, a bad screenwriter drops into um, a movie about the year 1955 where nothing else is accurate but like if you if you sprinkle that word in then the the, the viewer will will pick up on what you're on on what you're trying to communicate but it was i i read adele morales mailer her um that's norman mailer's second wife whom he almost killed by stabbing her at a party um for those of you who haven't read the book uh but she used that word for jeans in her memoir. And her memoir was published in the 90s or late 90s or early 2000s. Um, and that was just the word that was used. Um, and so that gave me the confidence to use it. So yeah, there are there are some sort of modulations. Um, but yeah, I think that she is remembering these conversations and she is translating them into her, right. into her own voice to a certain extent. Um, and for all of the ways in which the novel is is really fragmentary, you know, there's there is a, a, a sort of centr central through line, but each chapter jumps um, in time and place. I wanted the voice to be something that the reader could hold on to, and that meant making sure that even in even in um, sections where the narrator herself is not speaking a great deal, that her that the, the sort of quality of her voice, the confidence of that sort of pushing forward um, is present also in other, in other characters' voices. Um, Martha wrote a few moments ago and uh, she said, uh, I think it's fascinating that you say that you used certain punctuation of vocabulary because you want the reader to have, um, oh, I lost a question. <laughs> Somebody else can ask a question. Uh, David Wax says, do you find that English tends to have or aims to have more specificity than Italian? I think my English has more specificity than my Italian because I'm a better speaker <laughs> of English than I am a speaker of Italian. Um, but I think, and I think, I feel like everyone who speaks more than one language would find this to be true. There are some, there are some words in Italian for which even if there is an English equivalent, it does not translate in the way that I, I would wish it to translate. And I'm thinking of a very banal example right now, but um, the, the word for, for jam, as in door jam in Italian is soglia. And there's something about that word that to me communicates um, border, threshold, um, sort of all of the metaphorical weight that door, that jam as in door jam does not quite communicate. But if you're saying threshold, then you're, you're sort of reaching for an elevated, you're, you're reaching for the elevated language and for the metaphor in a way that is, is not the case if you're just using the, the word for door jam in Italian. So yeah, in 99% of cases, um, the, in 99% of cases, um, English is more specific because I just don't know what the word is in Italian. But there are these, um, and also because Italian is a language that that um, sort of retains dialects in different in different regions. I think, in fact, there are very specific words that I just don't know um, that are either in Italian um, as it is spoken, sort of generally, and then also in the regional dialects. Now that, that reminds me of a question I wanted to ask Emily, which is that as, as lexicographers are working on dictionaries, we often hear people talk about how this language has the specific word for this and English has no word for this. And how do you deal with that, Emily? Because my, my response has always been like, if, if they say, you know, whatever Flemish has a word for two cows on the side of a hillside on Tuesday afternoon, I feel like we say two cows on the side of a hillside on a Tuesday right. afternoon. It's the same thing. I mean, do you, do you have an answer for that when people... No, I mean, I, I, I feel the same way about it. It's, it's, there are these lovely little miracles of words that, that contain 
contain what we use for to what we use a phrase to formulate in just a, a single utterance in a single word. Um, but I, you know, I, I think all languages do that to some degree or another. I think that English does have an unusual because of the influence of French coming later, you know, the Norman invasion and like English, English does end up having these parallel terms um, that are part of everyday vocabulary. And um, it's, it, so it, um, but I don't know Italian, so I don't really know how it compares exactly. Uh, yeah. I was going to say to me that there was this, in the, our second unabridged dictionary, this is lovely word which we no longer define, which was the uh, emporte, uh, which is taken from the French, and we defined it as irritated beyond self possession. And I thought, wow, what a, <laughs> what a great word. I feel like it's, it's my, my kind of mantra. I, I carry this around with me most times. But I think there is no real semantic difference between irritated beyond self possession, between four words and, and one. They're, we can communicate the same thing. I don't know that I agree with you there, actually. I mean, I think there is really there is there is some power behind having a, a, a having having that meaning all settle in one in one word. Right. Yeah, I, I always felt like Spanish was which I've, I've been trying desperately to learn for years and with very little success. But I always felt like it was it was a very dramatic language because they would say things like um, every day is total todos los días. It's all the days. And to me, that feels like it's got so much more gravitas rather than just every day but I don't know if I'm just reading into that and in Spanish it's just the equivalent of every day. It's true that sometimes if I translate an Italian expression directly into English I realize that what it's saying is ludicrous um, and now of course I cannot think of an appropriate example um, but there's it's it's weighted in that way that you're saying the the Spanish phrase might be um, but it isn't if you use it every day, of course. Um, the thing that I was going to say before is it, something that is, um, is interesting to note, and I don't want to come down on one side or the other, is the way in which English technology words have infiltrated at least sort of European languages so that um, email is email in Italian. You just say it with a, with a little Italian accent. Um, of course, the exception, of course, being France, which is desperately trying to to cling to Curiel, um, which I feel like it's not. Come on, guys, just you should just you should give that one up. <laughs> uh, a, a reader named Barbara wrote uh, earlier today and asked, uh, "Please elaborate on your use of works not cited, which is a section at the end of the book, including, for example, how Robert Caro's The Years of Lyndon Johnson figured it out." And this, if you could also explain for our readers who haven't finished the book or haven't read it, what, what the work's not cited, not cited section is. Yeah, so at the back of the book, um, I have three or four pages of works which are not directly referenced in the novel, but which were on my mind when I was, when I was writing the book, um, or that are sort of permanently embedded in my mind and which I could not get away from if I tried. Um, so, for example, there's a Matchbox 20 song in the back of here, and I'm, I'm not proud of that, but it has, <laughs> been, it has been stuck in my brain since I first listened to that CD when I was 11 or 12. Uh, and it did like profoundly inform my understanding of like adult sexuality and what adult relationships were supposed to be like. Um, so, so in it went. Um, some of the things that I put in were more reflective of the culture that I was consuming at the time. And I'm not sure how, if or how these, these bits made, made it in, but it, it seemed like if I was going to, if I was going to put a works not cited in the back, and I got the idea from um, this really wonderful book called Frock Healer by Azreen Vandervliet Alumi. Um, if I was gonna, if I was going to say, oh, these are all my influences, I, I couldn't just have my influences be sort of the most, um, the most elevated and the most high-minded things that I was consuming. It would also have to be Matchbox 20. It would also have to be something like um, Robert Caro's Years of Lyndon Johnson, which I, I listened to on audiobook um, during a time in my life when I was commuting um, very long distances by car uh, about once every two weeks. And I, I feel like the, the person who narrated that book, his voice is, is in my head. And also the structure, I think, 
well, two things. The structure of the Caro books is, I mean, I, I think I could spend months or even years just re rereading those books and, and figuring out how Caro manages to, um, to piece together Johnson's life. Um, but also he's, he's really good at reproducing dialogue and you have to, I mean, I, I'm sure some of that was recorded, but some of that has to be, some of that has to be a little bit recreated. So that's, that's, that's sort of why that's in there. I, I love the Matchbox 20 uh, reference. And, and, and what, what that reminded me of is uh, when our, uh, in 1961, Merriam-Webster published a, our third new international dictionary, which uh, had a lot of uh, contentious reactions from people. And one of the things that, and Emily, correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the things I remember people really didn't like was that um, we had a much broader range of citational evidence, yeah. including uh, Ethel Merman. And I remember some people were furious that the dictionary would stoop to quoting Ethel Merman, uh, kind of from the misplaced idea that, that we should only be quoting the, the highest, you know, most elevated voices, when in fact, we're, we're, we're concerned with getting as much of the language as we can. Um, Emily, do you know, have, have we cited Matchbox 20 at all? Or, um, have, I'm have not you... aware of any Matchbox 20 um, citation, no. Not, okay. not that I've made it into the dictionary. It's very, I mean, it, it could happen it's though. Time. Right. I'm if surprised. Send them in. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm surprised that people were upset about, I feel like Ethel Merman, the singing mermaid, like she's, she's a goddess. She's, right. she's, a, she's a goddess among us. Like, how could you object? A singing mermaid said it. Like, what, <laughs> what could your objection possibly right. be? Right. It's clearly a word in the language. Yeah. Um, we, we, I found that earlier question that Martha was asking, which is, she said, um, I find it fascinating that you say that you used certain punctuation of vocabulary because you want the reader to have a certain understanding or feeling. Do you think of the reader from the very beginning of your writing process or is that part of edits or revisions? Oh, I think unfortunately I'm always thinking of the reader. Maybe not unfortunately. Um, it's, it's the reason actually I've never been able to keep a journal or a diary for any sustained length of time because I, I cannot, I was, I was actually joking with some friends the other day that like, I don't know how to address the void. Like, I can't imagine going back and reading my own diary. And I can't imagine how I would write to the person, to the version of me who would do that. And I also, I truthfully just like, I can't address the void. I can't write if not for an imagined audience. Um, I think that's one of the things that makes writing very difficult for me as well, because I, I always, even when I am in the early stages of drafting, I want to be writing something that feels like it will communicate appropriately to an imagined reader. Um, and so every single sentence is extremely painful because I have, you know, something sort of unformed and shapeless in my head. And I will not let myself put a sentence down that is, that is shapeless in that same way. Um, something I, I wanted to bring up earlier, which is that uh, I had this thought, which is that people often seem to think, and we, we Emily and I, and all people involved with dictionaries hear this often, uh, people often think that the dictionary is, is, exists to tell them what is correct about language. And, and in a way, it's kind of the opposite. I mean, I feel like a lot of times we're running along behind the users of the language, frantically trying to keep pace with what's changing. Um, and as an author, do you, do you feel like you are, as a native speaker of English, do you feel like you are driving the dictionary or the dictionary is driving your choices? I mean, I should probably be in, in closer dialogue with the dictionary, honestly. Um, but I, I do think that I, like most people who spend a lot of time online, am getting vocabulary from the like the youth space that is the internet. And like, I was once a youth and I am no longer a youth. And so now I am merely observing as, as terms sort of come into, um, come into existence. Um, and yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, I like the approach that the dictionary, that your dictionary has taken more recently, which is to, to do the kind of running alongside as opposed to sort of trying to, um, uh, sort of set up some kind of wall that is, you know, it, correct usages over here and incorrect usages over here. And at a certain point, yeah, I mean, there's something, there's something in me that, that 
insists that the word inflammable cannot mean cannot mean the same as flammable. But if that's how people are using it, you know, the important thing is that you're communicating that like this tent can catch on fire. <laughs> Emily, by the way, do you have any 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 prescriptive tendencies at all? I, I feel like I, I've meant to ask you this question. Are there, are, like, do I? And you're asking me this now? And I, I, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. Um, but like, I, with your kids, do you do you ever correct their language use? Well, uh, I I I am a committed uh, distinguisher between lay and lie, and I I have I have I have I have done I have I have used that used that with my with my children and me and I I will confess to that. I, I don't think you're doing them a disservice. I mean, I think one of the things that's going to be a long-term problem for my son is that whenever he asks me what a word means, I say, well, it could mean, and I, you know, he said, he says, does this mean this? And I say, it's possible. Um, I, I feel like I'm kind of a little too admired in, in, in semantic ambiguity. Uh, yeah. And I, I don't think there's anything wrong with saying yes. And on right. certain occasions, if you want people to understand you, when my when my ten year old was a baby, I um I had a conversation with myself about whether or not to use the um, singular they, and uh, and I decided that I I would, that I would I would uh, follow through on that, to use the singular they because it uh you know it's it's fully established now blah 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 but uh, when my daughter was born five years later there was just no. It, 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 it really, I felt like that issue had even crossed, a, it, had, it had crossed a threshold. Yeah, I, I, one of the things I found fascinating, because singular they has been a, a really contentious point in the last 10 years, of course, but um, is over, overhearing kids at my son's school talking. And to me, I, one of the things that I, I found objectionable about the ob objections to singular they is that it's too complicated. And if you hear kids who grew up with singular they, they have no trouble. It's yeah. just, they, they've learned how to speak this language and they effortlessly and always accurately use that word correctly. Um, so I, I think you know we can learn how to use singular they, but I and you you mean that you mean they use the non-binary singular yeah. they? Right, I've, yeah. I've heard not binary they use, and yeah. it's just sometimes they can they can switch back and forth between binary right. and non-binary in terms of pronoun use, and it really presents at least among the eleven and twelve year olds I've I've overheard seems to be no trouble. Yeah. It's a more elegant solution to the problem okay. also of, um, I, I don't know who the, I don't, I don't know the gender of, you know, if you want to refer to someone and you just don't, you don't know if that person is male, female, non-binary, whatever the case may be, it's, it's just so much, it's so much more elegant than what I was taught in elementary school, which is he slash she, which is just the, the ugliest, the ugliest little construction that I can imagine. The singular they is 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 so much more flexible, right? And also that he she is is it's also um it 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 it's also incomplete, right? Of course. <laughs> so right. it's, yeah. Um, uh, speaking what, of word choice, can I, I? I have a question. I was um I was curious about your uses multiple times use of the word ground to mean floor. Hmm. This happens in uh, in San Francisco 2012 and also Fresno 2014. I had been aware of people in California saying floor when they meant the outside space, the ground. So yeah, you know, there's a leaf on the floor. I don't know, maybe they only say it for food though. Like I dropped this and now it's on the floor, but I had not heard this use of ground to mean floor before. And um, so I was wondering if that's something that you grew up with or if, um, if, yeah, what your relationship to that use of that word is. It must be something that I grew up with because I have, like, I don't, I don't remember making a decision. I don't, like, if you had, if you had told me, in fact, as you were telling me that I use ground for floor multiple times in this book, I'm not, I'm, I'm surprised to hear that. I, I, <laughs> I know that you are correct. Um, and I know that I went over you know, I, I think I retyped this entire book between five and eight times. So I chose ground over and over and over again <laughs> on multiple occasions and across many months. But um, yeah, that's that's interesting. Now I now I want to go back. If if you could 
if you want to send me, if you want to send me where, where you caught me using ground for, for floor, um, it does sort of instinctively make sense to me and it, and it, and it must instinctively make sense to me because I sure did use it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and I love it because it, 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 to me, I knew this was like a, I knew this was a California thing where I was pretty sure it was. Um, and the book is set there. And so it, uh, yeah. That is where, yeah, that is where I grew up. I spent the first 18 years of my life um, in a, in a place where everything was the ground. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have page numbers. I'll send you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, were there any, uh, any uh, word choices that you ended up having to battle copy editors about in terms of keeping in or changing our, our just stylistic things? Or did they just accept your choices whole? I had a very, um, I had a very, uh, what's the word I want to use? Um, open-minded copy editor. I'll put it that way. One thing that she did really help me with is um, I use a lot of M dashes. I'm sort of uh, mad for M dashes uh, and they are, they are truly useful. Um, I find not everyone likes them as much as I do, but something that was, that was very uh, important that she alerted me to is when when I was ending a sentence with an M dash versus when I was continuing a sentence that was being sort of interrupted by an M dash. Um, so there were a lot of questions about capitalization that I had to resolve during the copy editing phase. Um, but I got, you know, I didn't get pushback on, I didn't get pushback on usage. I didn't really get pushback on, um, you know, I, I know that I, um, I have, there are like comma splices all over the place. Like I know that there's, there's um, grammatical, there are grammatical errors in the book, but I, I was grateful to have a copy editor who was not interested in sort of getting in my way in that way. Right. Um, that brings us to a question from Lisa, which I think would be great to get answers from both of you is, uh, <laughs> is don't we want to learn rules so we can just decide how to break them? Um, um, yes, I, th I think so. I mean, I think I think that when you when you truly understand a rule, uh, it gives you freedom to to then to then break it. <laughs> you can you can work with more intentionality. Yeah, I. It's funny. I actually I don't. I must at some point in elementary school have been taught the rules of grammar. I must have but I, I'm young enough that I never diagrammed a sentence. Um, and I, I was for a time tutoring uh, in, when I, was, when I was working in publishing. When I was working in publishing, they were not paying me enough. So I was also tutoring on the side. Um, and I remember trying to help one of, these, um, one of these kids with their homework and it was grammar homework. And I was like, oh no, I actually do not, know a lot of these rules because the way I learned them or at least the way I remember learning them is by reading um, and just absorbing sort of sentence structure in that way. Um, so I, I absolutely agree that we should learn rules so that we know how to break them. Um, I also have like, I now have such profound, I mean, I, I have always had profound like empathy for people who are trying to learn English because it's such a nonsense language. Um, but really and truly, like some of the decisions that that were made, I don't know how many hundreds of years ago about how um, about how we were going to spell things and and how we were going to arrange things in a sentence. Um, when you look when you look back from from this perspective, it's um, not altogether clear why some decisions were made. Right. Well, and, and it was many of them were were wholly arbitrary. And in truth, grammar what we what linguists consider to be grammar is the structure of a language that you learn by virtue of being immersed in it, right? Mm. That, is, that is truly grammar and rules about where a preposition can go. Um, I mean, the, well, the, there are rules about where a preposition can go that nobody ever needs to learn unless they are a non-native speaker. Right. And the rule about you know, not putting a preposition at the end of a sentence, that's actually usage. It's not really grammar. Um, you know, in a, in a technical sense, although the word grammar gets used that way and that's fine too. But the, um, I do think that, that there's, there's a playfulness that a writer who, who knows the prescribed rules of usage um, can then enjoy that you, you, don't, you, don't, you don't 
that, that, that playfulness really comes from having a comfortability with those rules in the first place. Definitely. But I mean, I think you, whether you learned those rules um, in, a, in, in, a, in a formal way, you, you, you clearly know how to play with language, right? <laughs> Thank you. I think that the playfulness of the language is really one of the, the, the greatest things about this. We, we often get um, comments, queries, querulous letters from people who do seem to uh, equate grammar and usage in a, in a way that we typically don't, for instance, um, irregardless. Uh, and here's where I'm gonna see the number of participants on the screen go way down. Uh, there was nothing inherently ungrammatical about irregardless. It's, it's, it's awkward and it's putting a negative prefix in front of another negative prefix, which is something that English does with many, many other words we don't complain about. It is entirely a question of usage. Um, we have decided it is a bad word and so it is therefore a bad word. But it's not a grammatical error per se. Um, it's not violating the structure of language in any meaningful way that we don't violate in all kinds of other words. Um, the participants are still there. So, um, <laughs> the one I, the one I always think of. And, so the one I always think of is um, fewer and less, um, and how those those supermarket checkouts often it's it's you know ten items or less, and it should be ten items or fewer. But like, I like, I know what it means. I'm not confused. So it's not you know if it's if the sign is communicating appropriately, it it seems like. There, there are lots of problems in the world and like <laughs> the fact that you know star market it has a lane that's 15 items or fewer or less instead of 15 items or fewer it's just not at the top of my list right well they function as a shibboleth right like the people who know these rules and the people who don't know these rules and this is why i was a little bit embarrassed about being really uh really clear with my kids and making sure that they know the difference between lay and lie because actually in you know in in a conversation it's it, nobody is ever confused about the meaning there. What we're con, what 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 the real concern is is that you know what's right, that you know that you you know it, because it it's it's about it's about a status, really. In many of these cases, it's about knowing knowing the in language. Yeah. Um, I wanted to uh, bring up a question from Candice, who wrote, uh, I listened to the audio version of the novel, which she thought was terrific. And she wants to know how involved were you in that version? Did you have decision-making power about the choice of narrator, the direction, anything? She assumes you were aware early on that there would be an audio version. And did that influence your choice of wording or punctuation? Or anything? So um, I'll answer the last question first. I did know sort of quite soon after the book was sold that there would be an audio version. But by that point, the um, the text wasn't fixed at that point. I actually did quite a lot of, of work on it after the book um, was sold and, and my editor got her, her ex extremely brilliant hands on it. Um, but I didn't, I, I didn't write with that in mind, except to the extent that I am a person who reads things out loud to see if they work. Um, that to me is the ultimate test. I have, I have a friend actually who reads He's a writer of nonfiction, and so he writes quite long books. And this is so. This is even more impressive to me. He reads it all out loud. And that's like one of the last things he does before it goes in for copy editing, and he does this all standing up. And I'm, you know, I didn't do that, um, even though it would have been quite a bit easier. You know, I'm not writing a 300 page book that's like dense with research, um, but I do read things out loud to make sure that they they sort of work. And when I was you know, I, I'm really glad to hear that um, that Candace had a had a good experience listening to the audiobook because um, I want to think that that is down to well, obviously it's the um, it's it's all to the the reader's credit, but it's also I hope that I, I gave her something that she was um, she was able to work with. Uh, I did get three choices um, for for my reader, and I picked the one that I thought sort of worked best with the book. Mm -hmm. I see I see I mean secretly I'm not 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 such a secret, I'm about to say it, but I wanted to read the book myself and they wouldn't let me. And I was very disappointed. Um, I would be disappointed the... too. And I would love to hear you read the book. They didn't yeah, even let me audition, which I felt like, come oh, on, like, yeah. let, me at least send, let me send my tape in. <laughs> totally, totally. Um, 
you can answer any dictionary you want and we will not be offended if it's some other one. You, what's your desk dictionary? Do you have one on the desk? Or do you use it on the computer? Do you have a print copy that you go to? I think the dictionary that I used at home when I was, when I was growing up was in fact a Merriam-Webster. Um, and I have your app and that's the one that I use when I, I, cause I don't, um, I don't have a copy. I don't have a hard copy now. So I use, I do use your app. I think the, um, the sort of gold standard dictionary that, uh, I, I imagine if I were really, really rich, I would splurge on might be that, that, uh, like the, the OED with all its many volumes, but also it's like, that's so much real estate. That's, you know, it's so much real estate. And I, I guess if I'm really rich, maybe I just have a, maybe I just have a library that's all of my favorite dictionaries. <laughs> I mean, we love the OED. We use it yeah. constantly. It's, it is, it is an astonishing feat of, of lexicography and just brilliant work. Um, but we would like to point out that you can also typically get the online version of the OED through your local library. Um, hmm. It's not hard to get an online subscription for it. Um, and the online version is considerably more current than the great big 20 volume one. Um, and it doesn't really take up a lot of real estate. So And anybody... more easily browsable. If you're in, yeah. you know, G and you want to look up something in P, you don't have to. Yeah. Or you don't have to like, they have the little two volume edition, but it's in yeah. like minus four font. So you have yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. They used to have a one volume as well that had nine pages on the page. And that one was really cruel. That was just yeah. like a, a sad joke of, a, of, of an attempt to read. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I've spoken to a lot of people who research the OED professionally and pretty much everybody that I know now just says they just use the online one. Um, because the information is so much easier to take in. Um, are there any books that you always go to a print version as opposed to a digital version? Is there, is there a tactile thing there? Oh, with, um, so I think reference books are easiest to search online. Um, so yes, I'll go to um, an encyclopedia online or I'll go to your app to, to look up a word. But when it comes to actually looking, if there's like a, a, a quotation that I'm sorry, I, as I said, quotation, there's this professor, uh, there's this professor that I actually, I didn't even take a class with him, but he was so famous for, uh, for this, this, um, this tick that I've carried it with me. He insisted that you could use quotation only, you could only use quotation to refer to the, um, the text being quoted and quote was the verb and you can't use quote to refer to the uh the text being quoted anyway so i, I find myself even as i'm speaking right now thinking like can't use the word quote anyway so if i'm looking for a quotation um i will always go to the print version um it is you know if i'm if i have a pdf of the book if i'm writing a review or something i have a pdf of the book um, it's easy to search a word that way, but I remember where things are on the page. Um, and I have no visual memory for a PDF or for, you know, I'll, I'll read on my phone sometimes, but very rarely, or I have like a little first generation iPad mini and I'll read on that sometimes, but it's, I just, I don't have the visual memory for it. I think I started reading digitally too late. Emily, are, are there books that you will only go to a print version for? Do you have preferences when you're, when you're doing, a, doing defining work? Oh, I always prefer a print, a print book for, yeah. for pleasure reading, but for reference, you know, reference books. And actually I use many of the reference books I use, I don't have an electronic version of them. Yeah. Um, what I really want is for every book I read to have a concordance, every book, just please have a concordance. So I know where ev what page I can find every single word. Right. Nobody will accommodate me. That would be great. <laughs> I do. I realize I do actually have a reference book that I use only in print, and it's uh, an old, by now outdated, but it's like a thirteenth edition of the Chicago Manual of Style. Uh -huh. um, and I don't. I don't know. I found it because those books are quite expensive. I found it on a stoop, um, and I was living in Brooklyn, and I picked it up, and it is. It is, I, I found it, I found it indispensable when I'm trying to figure yeah. out how to format something. 
<laughs> we're, we're getting close to the end. So I, mm -hmm. I, I thought we could kind of wrap this up in, in, a, in like the ultimate cliche uh, dictionary way, which is that we, we couldn't start this by saying Miriam Webster defines so-and-so is that, you know, that, that way that people have. But the, one of the, the second most cliche things that we get in, in the, the dictionary world is people asking, what's your favorite word? And I never have an answer for it because um, well, how could you have just one? Um, or it would be playing favorites or it changes from day to day. But uh, I can ask you, <laughs> I can ask Emily. <laughs> I, I get asked this question all the time. Emily, do you have a favorite word? I don't, I mean, I have, I have lots of favorite words. Um, yeah, actually none of them come to mind right now. Uh, but, 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 you know, I've always liked saying the word woozy. I don't like being woozy, but I think that's a funny word. So that's one of my favorites. Yeah. I, I don't have a favorite word, but just in the category of words that are fun to say, indubitably. Oh, that's a good one. A, just a real workout for the whole mouth area. <laughs> and it also, you just sound like a silly person saying it. There's <laughs> no one who's ever said indubitably and been able to keep a straight face or their interlocutor has not been able to keep a straight face if it was me. <laughs> um. Do we have any last minute questions from people coming in? Um, uh, do we have a moderator sending any more questions? Um, I don't see any, and if we haven't gotten to your question. Oh, uh, did you have any input on the book cover? Is a question from Heidi, it's last minute. Yes, um, so I, I did not send ideas, but I did get some covers back and say, no, thank you, uh, but this, cover it's by um the photograph it's a photograph actually which i i don't know how much sort of manipulation has been done to the image itself but not a painting which i thought initially when i was looking at it um by this photographer named maria zverbova and uh this was the british edition um they sent it to me like this basically and my american publisher was having a bit of a hard time figuring out exactly what they wanted on the cover and just as they'd sent me a cover that I was like, I'm so sorry, I cannot, I, I can't, I can't hold this book. Like I, I, I will take this cover off. Like if I go, if I'm going to a reading, like I'm just gonna take this cover off because I find it, I find it so repulsive. Um, I feel bad saying that. Um, I, I did not like it. Uh, but I had also just gotten this cover treatment from my UK publisher, Serpent's Tale. And so I sent it over and was like, something like this perhaps. And I think at that point they were just so sick of me because I, I had said no too many times. They just decided to um, to use the photograph. And like, it's uh, it's the same photograph that's, that's on the Spanish edition. It's gonna be on the French edition as well. So um, yeah, all credit to Serpent's Tale for, for putting this, this package together because it's, I mean, I really love it. It's beautiful. It's really yeah, I beautiful. Love it. Yeah. And, uh... Well, we're, we're just about at the hour, but thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for writing this lovely book. And thank you to all of our participants for joining in. Um, and we will soon be making uh, an announcement for next month's book uh, pick, which we hope that you join us for that as well. And um, it was just a, it was a delight talking to you and, and, and reading your work. So. Yeah, thank you so much, Miranda. Thank you. I look forward to being in the audience for next month's book club.